When Demunet decided to stage The Sleeping Beauty, which actually had been a bit of a flop in its previous London performances, Diaghilev tried to do it here, and whereas everything he did was a huge success, actually it was a flop because audiences were used with Diaghilev to seeing contemporary, you know, boundary-breaking stuff, and here was this classical ballet, so they didn't really like it. But, but Madame, I think, saw its importance and wanted to stage it, and it turned out that a guy called Nikolai Sergeyev had come out of Russia with um, notebooks which had the original choreography in it, and she was able to engage him to teach it to the company. I think the Second World War had launched British ballet because de Valois was able to travel the length and breadth of the UK during the war with a small group of dancers. But what she was doing all the time was building an audience. Very often we arrived on a Sunday afternoon or evening and, and we had to wander around and knock at doors and find somewhere that was free. We somehow lived very well on that massive sort of mashed potatoes or boiled potatoes and sausages and toast was the great thing. And I remember Ninette her husband was a doctor and she used to bring the soloists and principals glucose to help us and that made a great difference. When she was offered the chance to come into the Opera House in 1946, I think she was nervous of the fact that her dancers had become so cost accustomed to dancing in these small spaces, in these canteens and barracks and oddest little performing spaces that they made up. I think the idea of an opera house stage, she felt, was beyond the company at that time. Ninette w was obsessed with making us project in a large theatre because we'd never been in as large a theatre as the Royal Opera House Covent Garden. And I remember her saying, it's not enough, you've got to express with every part of your body, it's no good, your face just lighting up, your whole body's got to light up and throw it to the back of the gallery. I think it's a hugely important work because it's, if you like, the epitome of, of classical, never mind classical ballet, but classical. You can look at Sleeping Beauty and within it you can see all the, um, the tenets of classical architecture, for instance, the balance, the symmetry. It's, it's particularly a woman's ballet. There are not that many big roles for men in the Sleeping Beauty. But for the women it remains such a test because basically the ballet is built on classical classroom steps. The Tchaikovsky score is so immediately attractive uh, because, you know, it's, it's not about, really, about fairy stories. It's about growing up, it's about falling in love, it's about passion and regret and, you know, the optimism of life. This Sleeping Beauty score is perhaps the, the grandest of all ballet scores because in the 19th century, ballet music was not really on this scale at all. Another wonderful thing about Sleeping Beauty is the, the musical quality of the pas de deux. I think the collaboration between Tchaikovsky and Petipa, who made the choreography, was quite exceptional. You'd see that nowadays, perhaps, but, you know, this was 100 years ago, over 100 years ago. And whereas at the Mariinsky there were a lot of in-house composers who would just supply tunes for the choreographers, you know, very rumpty tumpty music, Tchaikovsky was absolutely not one of those. He was a, a, a hugely respected and successful composer. But he was willing to work with Petipa, almost writing the music to order. When you're on the stage dancing it, the music feels like it's there absolutely as a support. It's like a, a net that you can, you can lean back and because the music will, will keep you going. I think that it's going to be very interesting to, to, to see what people make of the realisation of my um, statement, really, that we were going to use Messel. Because, in fact, we are using his uh, set designs exactly as they were for the prologue, Act 1 and Act 3. The strength of Oliver Messel's work, I think particularly for Stephen Beauty, was that he got the scale right, that the, uh, uh, the, particularly the architectural sets 
are very impressive because, you know, this is not a naturalistic drama and it's not realism. So you've got, um, you've got music that is more beautiful than beautiful. You've got a story which is more of a fairy story than ever. So you've got palaces and architecture, which has nothing to do with even the grandest of uh, castles, because this is the grandest castle. And you've got a princess who isn't just pretty, she is the most beautiful woman in the world. So he caught, the, um, he caught exactly what the music does, which is to turn this myth into a great operatic drama. Opera is the wrong word, but the grandeur of, of, of the great love in everybody's life. Where the costumes are concerned, and <laughs> most particularly the colours, I think that Peter felt that he wanted for me to allow him um, to change some of the colour palette, and we've done that. What I've tried to do is not a museum creation of Oliver's costumes. I have tried to give the feeling of Oliver's costumes in their sort of grandeur and certain design peculiarities he had, um, but adding my own, um, I hate to use the word taste, but uh, my own slant on it. It's a lovely ballet, and Lilac Fair is a lovely role. Princess Aurora is a wonderful role. It's the music which is so inspiring. And the choreography was written for the music, and the two just go together. The dancer's dream, really. <laughs>